Hello and welcome to IdeaGen TV, powered by Azure and presented globally by Microsoft. Today we are thrilled to welcome Margot James Copeland, member of the AARP Board of Directors, as she joins us for a power talk on the importance of goal three, good health and well-being. Margot, welcome. Thank you, IdeaGen, for this forum on the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts on goal number three, good health and well-being. At this time when COVID-19 is still creating an enormous amount of suffering and limiting our daily life in many ways, we need to intensify and broaden our efforts to vaccinate more people. And we need to also make that we apply sensible measures to resist the spread of the disease. The threat posed by the Delta variant has made this work even more critical and, of course, more urgent. At AARP, we're continuing our efforts to ensure that more Americans are vaccinated against COVID-19 with a particular focus on vulnerable seniors. As the federal government proceeds on booster shots, we're advocating for a transparent distribution plan that is more efficient and user-friendly than what we've seen earlier. We want to ensure that older adults are prioritized and that they will know when, where, and how to get booster shots. Vital as those tasks are, there is so much more to do. Recovery should not mean the status quo pre-pandemic. It's long past time for a greater focus on the disparities in healthcare and the external factors influencing health. Disparities that COVID-19 has widened and illuminated. Between 2018 and 2020, the U.S. life expectancy dropped an astounding 1.87 years, according to research from Virginia Commonwealth Institute, the University of Colorado Boulder, and the Urban Institute. This profoundly negative development was even more staggering for people of color. Life expectancy fell by 3.25 years for Black Americans and 3.88 years for Hispanics compared to 1.36 years for whites. This study found that life expectancy for Black men fell to its lowest level in more than 20 years. The loss of life expectancy in the U.S. far exceeded that of other countries. Let's look at some of the disparities that can lower the quality of life and shorten lives. When we think about this subject, we have to think about social determinants of health. The external factors, any one of which can be the X factor, the variable producing the greatest impact on outcomes. Social determinants of health is perhaps not the most memorable name for this highly consequential category. It includes education, housing, poverty, employment, transportation, the availability of healthy foods, clean air and water, social isolation, and violence. At AARP, we strongly recommend and provide helpful tips for a healthy diet, exercise, and social connections. We advocate for safe, affordable, and convenient housing and transportation. Even as we offer advice and tools for healthy living, we recognize that external factors can severely restrict individual choices. Healthy eating can be difficult in a food desert, a neighborhood lacking a grocery store, especially a grocery store without fresh produce. The best medications in the world cannot work if you can't afford to get them. Social distancing to avoid COVID-19 may be more of a theory than a solution 
in the face of overcrowding housing conditions or frontline jobs. Visiting a friend can be out of the question if there's no safe way to get there. How much does this matter for our health? One study found that prolonged social isolation is as bad for one's health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Will we get to a point where such external factors are much more fully integrated into healthcare policy? The experience with passing the Affordable Care Act in 2010 can be instructive here. For many decades, there was an infuriating unfairness in healthcare coverage. You could be turned away for having a pre-existing condition. Finally, legislative gridlock was overcome and a law was enacted, making sure people could get coverage despite pre-existing conditions. Today, we take it for granted that people with pre-existing conditions cannot be denied coverage. Can we get to a point where external factors, social determinants of health, become an essential part of the healthcare equation? I believe we can, although this new paradigm may come incrementally advanced by promising programs across the country. At the same time, there are steps we can also take right now, literally and figuratively, to increase our lifespan and our health span, the years in which we are in relatively good health. One of the top concerns for older adults is brain health, staying sharp as we age. In 2020, almost 6 million Americans age 65 and above had Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. That figure is projected to reach more than 8 million by 2030 and almost 14 million by 2050. Meanwhile, the top killer of Americans is heart disease. Fortunately, studies show what's good for the brain is good for the heart. Fresh, nutritious food, staying physically active, getting enough sleep, maintaining social connections. I encourage everyone to go to stainsharp.aarp.org to learn more about how to promote brain health. I've touched on external factors with a big impact on health, as well as steps we can take to stay healthy. Now I'll turn to some important policy changes AARP is advancing that could promote good health and reduce stress. These are all things that Congress could pass and the president could sign into law this very year. I'll start with prescription drug prices, an issue of tremendous importance to millions of older adults. An AARP survey released in July showed that more than half, 58% of adults 50 and older are concerned they will not be able to afford prescription drugs over the next few years for themselves or their families. 77% reported they take prescription medications on a regular basis. And one fifth said they chose not to fill a doctor's prescription in the last two years. Cost was the most common reason given for not filling a prescription. AARP strongly supports requiring Medicare to negotiate for lower drug prices, requiring rebates when prices increase faster than inflation, and capping out-of-pocket costs for medication under Medicare Part D. The average Medicare Part D enrollee takes more than four prescriptions each month, and over two-thirds have two or more concurrent chronic illnesses. At the same time, the annual median income for Medicare beneficiaries is just under 
$30,000. It is simply not right or logical to expect this population to absorb rapidly escalating prescription drug prices. Many face the very real possibility of choosing between their medication and other basic needs, such as food or housing or utilities. There is no reason Americans should continue having to pay the highest brand name drug prices in the world. It's time for Congress to take action to lower prescription drug prices. Lowering the cost of prescription drugs would also shrink disparities in healthcare. People of color are more likely to have chronic illnesses such as high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease. Chronic illnesses that are treated with prescription drugs. Here is another key policy change in Medicare that would make a huge difference. AARP has long supported closing the gaps in health coverage by including dental, hearing, and vision coverage in the Medicare program. The lack of coverage for this important health benefit leads to worse health outcomes for older Americans and could actually cause higher Medicare spending. It also widens disparities. The Kaiser Family Foundation found that while 49% of Medicare beneficiaries did not visit a dentist in 2016, that figure for African Americans was much higher, 71%. To achieve the best possible health outcomes and the greatest value, Medicare should cover the entire person from head to toe. The third and last policy change I'll mention is not generally thought of in terms of health care, but it can have an effect on health, and that is caregiving. Caregiving can involve the health not only of the loved one who is being cared for, but of the caregiver as well. The financial burden can easily add to the emotional stress for caregivers. Today, there are almost 48 million family caregivers in our country. They are the backbone of America's care system. They help make it possible for older adults and people with disabilities to live independently in their homes and communities where they want to be. AARP believes family caregivers have earned support as they take on these costs and responsibilities associated with caregiving. Family caregivers spend nearly 20% of their income on caregiving expenses, almost $7,000 per year. For Hispanic and Latino family caregivers, it's 47% of household income. And for African-American caregivers, it's 34%. AARP strongly supports the Credit for Caring Act, which would provide a tax credit of up to $5,000 for caregiving. Having made some points from a macro perspective, I'll conclude by getting down to the micro level. As we focus on a holistic approach that takes in people's environment, as we advocate for sound policy prescriptions, let's not overlook a vital ingredient in good health care, doctor-patient communication. Advocacy is not, is not just something for the halls of Congress and state houses. People have to advocate for themselves with their medical providers. If for whatever reason you can't do that, someone must advocate for you. Advocacy and accuracy go hand in hand. It may be a good idea to take some truth serum before we go to the doctor. In the 2018 study of the Journal of the American Medical Association Network Open, 
found that more than 80% of patients withheld the truth about how frequently they exercise, their diet, and whether they regularly take their prescriptions. But truth telling only works when there is active listening. Remember, communication is a two-way avenue. In 2018, the study by the Journal of General Internal Medicine showed that the median time in which doctors interrupted their patients was 11 seconds. Surely we can do better than that. To formulate the solution, doctors need to understand the problem. For patients who are poor, doctor-patient communication can be especially challenging. At KeyBank Foundation, where I had the honor of serving as chair and CEO, we funded training for medical professionals to make sure they could work effectively across multicultural and multi-ethnic communities, developing the cultural competency needed for today's healthcare providers, the competency needed for healthcare providers of the future, a crucial component, we believe, to bridging healthcare divide. So in conclusion, I will end on this point, and that point is the importance of listening. And I thank you for listening to me.